if I talk away from it, if it's quiet, let me know. I'm going to be very quiet so that uh, Quinn Chappelle up there in the back row doesn't get woken up unduly. We have our youngest, newest Civil War enthusiast visiting today. I'm delighted that you're here. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and Jeff did point out this is the 14th lecture that we've done so far on the Civil War history in Knoxville. And um, this is an opportunity for me to make a pitch for our museum. As you know, we're part of UT physically, uh, but you may not know that we do not get a huge amount of support. We rely very heavily on our membership. And if you're interested in all, at, the, at all in becoming a member of the museum, um, you get discounts at the gift shop and you get a great newsletter every month. And it's, it's a really worthwhile thing to do. So at the back of the room, there's, a, there's literature. Uh, if you're interested, please take it with you. We, we'd love to have you all be members of our museum. And all right, it's now five after two. Once again, I have gotten into a topic that I find absolutely fascinating. And there's way too much to handle in 45 minutes, so I hope I'm going to get to all the important stuff. Uh, we will finish with a grand tour of the, uh, <laughs> the construction over there. Uh, it's not exactly a Bucky Dome, but it is a way of getting a, an eight-foot diameter hoop up in the air so that you can see at eye level what no one has seen since 1864 quite that way. And this is the technology and artistic renderings of Knoxville as created by George Barnard. Now, George Barnard is a, yes, thank you, yeah. All right, <laughs> okay. The first book many of us read on the history of Knoxville Civil War past was by Digby Gordon Seymour. He wrote it in 18, six, I'm sorry, 1963 as a part of the centennial celebration. That was 50 years ago. And he's still signing copies if you can, if you can uh, find him. He, he, he did an, an amazing job back in eight, 1963, way before you could get online and look at downloaded pictures from Library of Congress. He had to correspond. He had to uh, request negatives and prints and, and find these things, request them. All of the things that are so difficult um, when you are the first to do the research. And he was the first. He pulled it all together. And he knew George Barnard. Not personally, no, not personally. He knew the work of George Barnard. In his book, the wonderful 1864 photographs that he has printed as part of his, as part of his work are attributed to George Barnard. Later, well, we'll get into that. Later, it became less apparent at a national level what was George Barnard's work when he did it and how uh, the sequence of his work was actually uh, taken, how he did what he did, when he did it, where his negatives went, how he got published, all that kind of thing. Um, I think now, though, in the 50 years since uh, uh, Digby Seymour did first identified George Barnard as the person who did these amazing photographic documentation of Knoxville Civil War era, um, I think that uh, Barnard has come into his own. So I wanted to look at uh, as many of you know, the way I love to study Civil War history is Knoxville-centric. Uh, I just want to know what happened here to start and figure out locally what it is that we own and how it is that we um, uh, relay the information from 1864 to present day and how we identify what was there then with what is here now. So these photographs I've known for a long time. Uh, they were the one of the first ways that I get into it, especially since I knew that uh, Orlando Poe was the engineer that arranged for Knoxville to be photographed. And so uh, I want to tell you about this photographer and look at a little bit at that larger history of Civil War photography. Something that, I mean, if, if any of us knew anything about Civil War photography, for years we thought that Matthew Brady took every single picture that was ever taken during the Civil War. Uh, that, of course, is not true. Then we began to hear that Brady hired other people 
And some of those pictures actually weren't Brady's, and then we heard names like O'Sullivan or Gardner. And at any rate, it's much more complicated than all of that. So let's start looking at the guy who was here, George Barnard. And there's a picture of him. In fact, George Barnard did work for Matthew Brady. He was in New York City uh, in a, a late 1850s, and this portrait was done by Brady. Brady was an excellent photographer. Brady was a successful photographer, although ultimately he did not succeed financially. But his studio in New York City was the place to go to have your portrait done, or in Washington, D.C., where, of course, there were politicians and generals and, and, and famous people. But this is the kind of portrait that Matthew Brady did, and this is his version of George Barnard. Barnard was actually born in Connecticut, 1819. And as a young man, his father died when he was a boy. His mother and uh, elder siblings moved uh, several times. And he spent some of his early life in Nashville. I think that's interesting. George Barnard, despite being born in, in Connecticut and being associated with New York State, um, spent quite a lot of time in the South prior, during, and after the war. He began his first commercial studio in Oswego, New York in 1846. The daguerreotype was the process. Oh, and by the way, I'm, I know there are people in here who are probably interested in the technology of photography, daguerreotypes and amber types and um, collodion and all of those kinds of terminology. I, I'm not going to try to get into that very deeply, except to kind of give you a sequence of, the, of, uh, of how, it, how it came into use and the first process that uh, Barnard used was daguerreotype. He was a, had a studio where people would come, have their portraits taken. Uh, daguerreotype has a long life if it's in, sealed in a, in a case. That's why we find in antique stores still those wonderful little cases with the pretty metal clasps and the leather tooling. Um, those were functional. And in addition to uh, uh, being attractive, they, they, they served a function in preserving that, the daguerreotype underneath. Um, he was the first, he's credited with the first news photograph documenting an event in progress. There was a fire in Oswego at the Ames Mills in 1853, and he took a couple of images, and uh, they still exist at the George Eastman House in Rochester, New York. George Eastman House is one of the finest places to go for the history of photography. Yeah, that makes, makes a lot of sense. And uh, these early uh, photographs, uh, uh, daguerreotypes were taken and, uh, and preserved there. Um, by the late 1850s, he had moved to New York City to work for Matthew Brady. Um, in his personal life, it seemed like he and his wife separated or whatever was going on. He went there for his profession. His family did not go with him. Um, his Civil War legacy is unique and important, that I'm going to get into that. But even after the war, he moved back to Charleston. And he had a studio there for a while. He moved to Chicago in 1871, three months before the big fire. And much of his professional uh, legacy was lost to, the, to that fire. Uh, he did, then moved back to Charleston in 73. In his later life, he also lived in Alabama for a while. And in 1880, he moved to Rochester, where he was hired by George Eastman. So he, has, he was there in the beginning. He was well published. He was well respected. And he had a very uh, uh, fine reputation as a photographer before the Civil War. And he died in 1902. This is that earliest news photograph, the daguerreotype. And you can see it's quite telling of what happened. This is a fire in a mill in Oswego, and um, that's how it might be preserved. You recognize the leather case. And this is colorized by, would have had to be by hand, of course. Everybody here knows color photography was way in the future when this happened. But this is considered to be, and you see there's a canal boat there, and the, uh, he's actually got part of the building collapsing. So this was, this was a significant moment in photojournalism. Now, his Civil War career. He uh, was working for Brady in Washington in 1860. He was actually reproducing the very large carte de visite collection that Brady had amassed. Now, carte de visite, 
is a you know, French term for visiting card. Uh, you know, people would um, visit. This is a different time, a way different era. But if you went on social calls and you left your card, um, that was something people had been doing for a while. Well, with the innovation of a cheap, uh, relatively uh, easy way to have your image uh, taken and reproduced, then you could have your card with your picture on it. And just like baseball cards today, it became quite a thing to collect uh, these cartes de visite, especially of important people. And of course, Brady had the best collection there at, uh, in existence. Between his New York studio and his Washington studio, he had quite uh, a, a huge collection, and he hired um, Barnard to help to reproduce that so he could market it. And, this is just like today, you know, when you think about uh, uh, internet technology and uh, copyright and uh, who, who owns what, who owns intellectual property, who gets to sell what, all of those things they were dealing with. A number of, of, of the innovations in photography apparently were just given away. It was like, oh, this new process works, I'll tell you about it, uh, write to me, I'll give you the information. And uh, so fortunes were, could have been made and um, many they did not even bother to patent their advances in, in photographic technology. In any case, uh, Barnard was one of the photographers who went out to first Manassas, um, or Bull Run. You remember that first uh, summer, 1861, everybody thought the war was going to last maybe one or two fun battles, and then it was going to be over, and uh, a lot of young men from here, this area, are racing up to the east. They were afraid they were going to be too late to get in on it. I wanted a part of the, to be a part of Lee's army. So this awful event happened at uh, First Manassas, and a number of people in Washington took their buggies and their picnic lunches and their champagne bottles and uh, rode on out to, to view the battle as if it were a summer afternoon baseball game. And of course, it did not quite go as anticipated. Uh, there was a Union route. The soldiers turned ran, retreated to Washington. The civilians were caught up in the military retreat. Uh, Barnard, according to the story, was on a wagon uh, with his large camera. And everybody knows how big these cameras were, the big tripods, heavy camera. He, he didn't take any pictures that day. And he gave up his seat on the wagon to a wounded soldier. And he ended up hiking all the way back to Washington with his camera uh, in tow. Um, Poe, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Barnard did, however, as, as a photographer in Washington, he became acquainted with McClellan. And of course, General McClellan, George McClellan was the first and um, ultimately the, uh, re the first one replaced it being in charge, commander, uh, general in chief of the Union Army. But Poe, Orlando Poe was on McClellan's staff and was undoubtedly at least acquainted with Barnard's work, e even if he didn't know Barnard personally, he may or may not have. But uh, the um, engineering crew, and of course Barnard Poe was an engineer first and foremost, for, uh, engineer, cartographer, uh, surveyor, uh, the people in the men, young men, cadets in West Point who'd graduated the top of the class, the, and Poe was six, um, would go into the engineering corps. That was the elite, that was the people, those were the guys that went out and, well, Poe first off after, the, after his graduation went out to survey the Great Lakes. Worked with uh, Meade, the same guy who took over just before the Battle of Gettysburg. Small, the Army was a small group of people who knew each other pretty well. but. In these early days of the war, McClellan was the uh, man in charge of the army, and he had a group of followers who were uh, the young men he had around him, and Poe was one of them. And Barnard was a part of that early group who photographed in the Washington area. In 1864, uh, and it was in December of 18, uh, uh, January 64, right, right at the beginning of that year, um, Poe was already in Nashville, of course, this is right after the Battle of Fort Sanders, and uh, Barnard is assigned to, the, uh, to, to, to Nashville. He, his, his group is the, I better say, Department of Mississippi. Somebody here would know that better. Department of thank you, front row. Uh, he was uh, assigned to be the photographer. He was not in the Army. 
he was a civilian working for the Army, but he was actually paid as much as a colonel of cavalry or a uh, colonel of uh, cavalry. Which other? At any rate, he, he, he made a lot more money, for instance, than Poe did. And although Poe, as his boss, had trouble getting the money to pay his employee because of Army red tape, and there are letters where Poe has written to say, you know, we've we got to pay this guy. In any case, Nashville was the first place that he took pictures in the West, uh, and that was in January and February of 1864. He then went to Chattanooga and took some wonderful shots. And he and Poe came t together to Knoxville in March of 1864 on the train. Uh, after that, he was with Sherman part of the time. He, Sherman particularly requested Poe and Barnard to be with him on his advance down through North Georgia to Atlanta. Uh, and Barnard was there part of the time, but once, uh, once Sherman left Atlanta, he was moving too fast for Barnard to be able to set up and take interesting shots. And there were no real battles. They, there were some skirmishes. Um, Wheeler was down there giving them some trouble, but that whole march took place um, pretty much unopposed by Confederate troops. And so when the photography came in that Barnard took in 1864. There were shots of the coast, there were shots of Fort McAllister, of Savannah, of Charleston, Columbia, but um, not too much of the Georgia part of it. So Barnard came back in 1866 and took additional photographs. And there is a letter that uh, is in the Poe papers in Library of Congress where Barnard writes to Poe, who stayed, and after the war, Poe was on Sherman's staff, and Barnard says he's thinking of putting together a photographic uh, compilation of his work. Gardner had already published his famous sketches, and that was already out to great critical claim and, and financial success, and Barnard thought he might do the same thing. He wrote to Poe, got Poe's wholehearted uh, endorsement and Poe and uh, Sherman. W Sherman was then approached by Barnard and Sherman said, great, it sounds like an excellent thing to do. So in 1866, Barnard's most famous, his, well, his only real um, album publication was actually done. It was sold, he speculated in the letter to Sherman and to, uh, to Poe that he would do 100 copies sell them for $100 a piece, which was very expensive for a book in those days. Um, but he was, only going to take, he was only going to publish that many if he had enough pre-orders to say that it would be successful. Well, he got plenty of pre-orders. It's not clear exactly how many he actually uh, finished. He may not have done the full 100. He had to print each photograph individually. You could not uh, print photographs at this time. That's why there's so many great lithographs in Harper's and other places, but we'll talk about that. In any case, this is what that photographic album looked like. I think this is kind of the standard cover, and if you wanted to go a little more deluxe, this is the uh, tool dot, you know, leather tool uh, decorated. It's got a little more pizzazz going on. And this is what the front, the, the title page said, Photographic Views of Sherman's Campaign. Bracing scenes of the occupation of Nashville, the great battles around Chattanooga and Lookout Mountain, the campaign of Atlanta, March to the Sea, and the great raid through the Carolinas. From negatives taken in the field by George Norman Barnard, official photographer of the military division of the Mississippi. And, um, of course, the New York address where he, he was working. Uh, this, uh, as I said, is um, very fine quality individual prints, and um, not very many actually still around. Uh, these are the 61 prints that appeared. And unfortunately, and this happens all the time in publishing, um, some of these albums were taken apart so that the prints could be sold individually. The prints are quite valuable in and of themselves, not nearly as valuable as the whole album, but a number of these prints were uh, distributed and sold uh, out after the album had been taken apart. I like this one very much. This is one of the first original photos. If you see the, in the album up the top, the first picture is Sherman and his generals. 
That's Sherman and his generals. You'll notice the one on the far left, that's O.O. O. Howard. He's got his arm, he's, he's lost an arm, he's got his sleeve tucked into his pocket. Um, and the man on the far right, standing right there, it seems to be the last one in the picture. Well, this is how it appeared in the album. You think Photoshopping is new? <laughs> the guy in the chair was not there. <laughs> Not for the original, that was Blair, and he was added later. It doesn't say that anywhere, um, but people who know photography and studied this whole thing, it says, oh yeah, he, he, he wasn't there for the original, but he's, he's been enshrined in the group. He's now part of the album. This is what the album looked like. And you can see it's got the, um, it's kind of a not true black and white, but he, these were actually more black and white than the Gardner publication. And underneath the name Sherman and his generals, and they're all identified. Uh, and other kind of picture in this album. This says, Rebel Work in Front of Atlanta, Georgia, number four. These uh, forts are all numbered. Uh, I mean, they're up to 11, I don't know how many altogether, quite, at least 11 and, and, and more than that. Um, and you can see the detail. One of the things Barnard always seems to do is include a human in some place, some place in the picture for scale. And another thing that he did repeatedly was a fake sky. See how dramatic that sky is? The old photographic cameras, at the process that he was using, didn't usually pick up that kind of detail in the sky. So in fact, it, it was a two-step process to do the original print and then put the sky in. Uh, the skies were reused, and of course, each of these albums is an individual production. So in some places, uh, you know, a single print might have different skies, and the same sky might appear in multiple prints. But it's for a dramatic effect, and, and of course, his work was not just documentary, it was artistic. And some of these pictures are, are striking in, in uh, uh, so many different ways. But it's, it's intentional. You know, the, the sky was something that he put in on purpose. Let me get rid of that. Wait a minute. There we go. And this one is another famous print. And this, people like today look at it and say, see what Sherman did to Georgia? Well, in fact, Hood burned his own train. This is the result of Hood burning his supply train. Hood, as you know, uh, is going, he's going to go through Franklin have a horrible battle there on to Nashville, and, and in his wake, he, he burned his own train in, um, in Atlanta. And again, you can see the sky is, is probably not the sky the day the picture was taken. I just, I like this one. It occurred to me, though, I might have this bridge mixed up. I think this is Whiteside. Does everybody, anybody, anybody verify? There were two different bridges. I'm almost positive this is Whiteside. It's just such an incredible engineering accomplishment. And look at the it's, and this is the kind of thing that Poe and other engineers were accomplishing, rebuilding. But you can see here there's a, there's a man sitting in the picture. Kind of a, and the water, he does such beautiful water. Um, and this is one of the, another one of those images that's in the album. Now this is the Nashville capital. And this one, I, I don't I think the sky's been enhanced in this, but it is an, an interesting sky. And you can see um, the tents on the front lawn. The uh, seems to be kind of under construction. There aren't any trees again, or very few, you know, the simple trees. And this is another, the sky in this one has been um, enhanced. And this one looks from the capital out over the town of Nashville. And this was probably done in the early days in, of, of 1860 when he first got to Nashville, but he did go back, and it might have been done in 66. And sometimes they have trouble, even the experts, figuring out which year it was, whether it was the 64 or the 66 trip where he took the picture. I'm sure there are details in here. And some, there's another version of this where the guns are covered. They're under canvas. Um, so um, there are those kinds of details that people can start to figure out sequence. I like the pe people pictures, and, and this is in Georgia. This was of, there he is, Sherman and staff. There's Orlando Poe. And uh, this is another one taken of pretty much the same scene. Uh, Sherman, I think this is Sherman. Now this, as you can see, is not as good a print. Some of these things get printed multiple times, and the 
resolution gets lost. But you, this is an old print, and I think Poe's back here. I sometimes play, like, where's Waldo? Where's Orlando in the picture? I think, I think he's back here. The, 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 these, some of these other people that in this picture are sitting back here have been kind of distributed into the back when the gun crew was brought in and, and more soldiers. This is a famous picture of Sherman on his horse. He, there's a nice letter that he writes after this picture was taken saying that the, the horse behaved like an absolute gentleman. Stood there and had his, had his image taken. This is in Atlanta uh, just before they start, they start the march to the sea. I like this one because it has the equipment. This is the wagon that Barnard needed. This is the tent. This may be Barnard or his assistant. Um, this, uh, and of course, the ones that have troops are going to be 1864. The images from 66 are pretty much empty of people, except in this one, and this one sold the single print, what Wes Cowan, people know him from Antiques Roadshow and, and other um, places. This particular print sh sold in 2006 for $1,500. This was taken in 66, and of course the 66, as I said, tend to, they don't, they w they're not gonna have the troops, the war is over. But if you look at this carefully, you can see his wagon, horse and wagon back here, and there's a tent, and his assistant is in the picture. Oops. And that, again, these details, um, you, you just don't notice the first time through. You would not look at that and say, oh, there's a picture of Barnard's uh, photographic equipment. But it's in there, and it's part of the landscape. Now, when Orlando Poe published, uh, he used, of course, the images from Knoxville. He was very proud of what he did here. It was significant. It was uh, an outstanding example of fortification and defense and all of that, and he wanted to document it. And he had a photographer on staff who could do it. So they took a train trip from Chattanooga. It took 13 hours to get here from Chattanooga in a snowstorm, and Sue Boyd, Remember Boyd's family down there at Blunt Mansion and, and all of that amazing story with Sanders and all of that. Anyway, she's on the train, and in one part of his diary, he notes that he has promised her to send a photograph of himself and Sanders. In any case, uh, he stays with Mr. Hoxie, another name that we hear. Hoxie was the manager of the railroad yard. Hoxie's the one who has the ex... ex um, expanse of uh, telegraph wire and suggests that the telegraph wire be used to create a metal entanglement so that the uh, fort is protected at for the slope of Fort Sanders. Um, any rate, uh, and Babcock was in town. We know that from Post Diary, but also because of the wonderful picture that I'm going to show you in a minute of that I've used a lot because I think it's just such a fine example of nailing down the details visually, um, but also uh, the photographs are, are dated and documented. And there, as soon as he sent them in with his official report, there were requests from all over the engineering department for, for copies of these images. He had a problem paying his uh, photographer, as I said. And also, as, as things went on, all of these people are writing and saying, please send me pictures, send me images. And he's, he's beginning to say, who's paying for all this? Does that sound familiar? Sometimes these things get a little bit out of hand. It's, at first, as a courtesy, you say, certainly, I'd be glad to send you images. And then when the 10th guy asks, it's like, uh, uh, this is beginning to add up. This is uh, a digital camera version. Um, my, my photographic <laughs> inabilities, but this is at the Library of Congress. This is Poe's diary. And you can see it's written in his own hand, but it's the date in his personal diary, the date's very clearly um, stated there. And he says, reached Chattanooga at 4.30 p.m., stayed with Wharton. Um, caboose with instruments did not come through. By instruments, that's the photo photographic equipment. He has a whole caboose full of stuff that Barnard, is, Barnard needs. Left Mr. Barnard at, and I can't really read that. What does it say? Stevenson, okay, oh, okay, great. Um, and to bring the instruments on, and he reached Chattanooga at, one p at 10 p.m. So Barnard and, and Poe are on the move. 
uh, left Chattanooga for Knoxville at 10 a.m., accompanied by Miss F and Miss B. Miss B is Miss Boyd. And um, they, uh, let's see, Ann General Elliott, who got off at Cleveland where we dined, reached Loudoun at 5 p.m. and left at 7 p.m., reaching Knoxville at 11 p.m. in the midst of a snowstorm. Stayed with Mr. Hoxie. And that's March 15th. <laughs> so it's not as if it's unusual to snow here in February and March. At any rate, went with Mr. Barnard to university and took panoramic view of the entire horizon from the cupola. The weather was cold and windy. And that's what is hanging over there. In case anybody doesn't know what the whole point of that apparatus is, that is the seven frame picture that they took on March 19, 1864. Now, engineering and photography were integrally connected. Poe was an avid amateur photographer himself. His per personal album, um, he collected carte de visite and military photographs and all of that, his personal album, of which there was only one. Unlike uh, Sherman's March to the Sea, that, or Sherman's campaign that, that uh, there were potentially 100 copies of, Poe's personal collection, of course, there was only one. It sold a few years ago for multiple thousands of dollars. At any rate, Poe knew of Barnard's work in Washington. He knew of the use of photographs for mapping, and Poe does talk about using these photographs to help to uh, make his maps more accurate. And he, all, he did include his photographs with the official report. When the atlas was published, the, and everybody here I'm sure is familiar with the, the official atlas of the Civil War, by this time, apparently, uh, they could publish photographs. I think that's true. I better not say that until I'm sure. I'm not sure if these are lithographs or photographs, but these are all of the images that Poe took in 1864. They look like photographs to me, but this wonderful big book that was published and republished, and you can spend hours and hours and hours. But the photographs from Knoxville are part of this uh, publication in the 1890s. Does anybody here know whether they would be photographs or lithographs? Great, thank you. These then are lithographs, which are done from the photographs. I wasn't sure when that ability to print photographs actually came in. Um, at any rate, there was a stir within the uh, engineering corps. As I said, the top West Point of uh, the top, top graduates went into, on to become engineers. And actually, General Meigs, who was quartermaster general of the U.S., had an interest in these photographs. And he was the very, one of the very first to ask for two sets, one for himself and then one to share uh, with others in, in, his, in his group. And Sherman said, oh, sure, absolutely, they are beautiful photographs. So this was something that was, it's the first time that it was really used in the documentary way. You know, up in the Eastern Theater, we had uh, uh, photographs after Antietam, the, the dead bodies that O'Sullivan and Gardner took. That was different. That was not meant to capture the, the fortifications. Uh, it, it was done with a different spirit. This one, these photographs that Barnard did out here in the Western Theater were much more documentary and extremely artistic, too. Um, in any case, there were so many requests for copies. As I said, Poe had trouble covering the cost and had to, be, had to write several times to, to make sure that, uh, that he wasn't paying for it, as he said, out of a captain's salary. Now, stereoscopic camera, apparently when Barnard got here in March of 64, he had three different cameras. One, a stereoscopic camera. And this is what a stereoscopic, you know, two images are slightly different. And when you look in the viewer, it gives it a three-dimensional quality. That's, that's the whole point of this. And he obviously had that camera here. This is Orlando Poe on the right and Orville Babcock on the left. Now, this is a different camera, and you can see they've switched positions. One of the things that happens with historic photography uh, is that these glass negatives, and they are, these are all originally on glass plate, they can get flipped. And so that over time, you may forget, or you may not, not, may not know what the correct position is. In fact, in Digby Seymour's book, 
the picture that I'm going to show you from Mabry Hazen House was published backwards. He identified flooded First Creek as Tennessee River, or Holston River, as it was called at the time, which meant, you know, it was on the, it, the image was actually flipped. Um, and that happened in many places. So, you know, when it, here in Knoxville, we can all be experts on which is right. But if we were to look at images from Atlanta or Chattanooga, I'm sure there'd be cases where it could, an image could easily be flipped and it wouldn't, we would not register that fact. But this is a, a, a very famous image uh, of Poe and Babcock. Well, for us anyway. You see it says number 25 on the bottom. I'm not sure we've seen all 25 of the ones that, that were here. Um, but when Poe wrote about, in, there was a, a, the Battles and Leaders publication that came out, uh, Poe did the story on the Knoxville campaign, and he used a lot of the images from that, uh, from, from Barnard's work. If you look at this one, and then you look at this, well, Poe and Barnard aren't there, but the stump is. And if you go back and forth, it's the same picture. He just took the two guys out of it. Because, of course, it had to be lithographed, and so it was easy enough not to include the two men, but the, the, the stumps are all the same, the uh, soldier in the background, all of that. So this was the, uh, what they used, but they left the two men out when they lithographed this particular image. Another one, this one, um, you can see, oh, I've, I've expanded this and, and I'm look, I've looked all through it trying to find, oh no, an 1863 coin or something in the, in the debris there and I haven't found anything. But uh, it was uh, taken with a different camera still and then lithographed like this. Defense of Knoxville. This is Poe's publication where he uh, talks about what happened here in, in uh, 1863. Now this one was interesting. This has been misidentified for quite a long time. This is, it was called Fort McAllister and they said Cooley, who is another Civil War photographer, and it's still identified this way. I copied the record from Library of Congress and you can see that there's a note Title based on information provided by Roger Durham, Director of Army Heritage Museum. And uh, he was in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, in 2007, we had a long discussion about this. I think he was, uh, he was just delighted to find somebody in Knoxville that's, that thought he was right. Uh, not that he couldn't have called Dot, called Dot Kelly, but somehow he got me on the phone. I know how it was. I called there looking for information about photographs. And, and when he heard Knoxville, Tennessee, he took the call. Sometimes you just try these things and they work. In any case, we looked at this and decided it was not Fort McAllister. It was Fort Sanders. And so, but you can see it still says Samuel A. Cooley was the photographer. And, even, and the notes say that it was Barnard. It's almost certainly Barnard, but there's still that confusion as to uh, who the photographer might have been. Now, Cooley, the thing that makes it even more complicated is Cooley was actually at Fort McAllister at the same time that Barnard was. That is a picture of Cooley as photographed by Barnard at Fort McAllister. So you can see how these old glass plate negatives, and there's no such thing as metadata. You, ha you can't write across the front of the photograph who took it when. And once they get stacked up, and of course they are explosive and they're hard to deal with and they're fragile, um, the information, the details as to who took it and where it was and when it was taken ha sometimes gets separated. So you can see where that picture might be called McAllister by Cooley because there are pictures of McAllister by Cooley, but that particular one we're pretty sure it was by Barnard and uh, not at that earlier date. There for, and one of the reasons we're pretty sure about that is in that same publication, Battles and Leaders, there's that picture by Poe. Poe isn't going to mistake McAllister for Sanders. And so that's pretty, pretty good evidence right there that it is Fort Sanders because Poe says it is. So. Um, but Li Library of Congress is, is, hasn't let go of the idea that it might, might actually be Cooley. Here's another one. Again, different camera. 
Uh, Barnard had three different cameras here in uh, Knoxville. And the, just these are some of the less well-known images. This is from Fort Stanley across the river. I love this one because when you enlarge it, you can see there are pots and pans down here. There's a blanket hanging over the, and then you can get into this. There's the university, the White House that is where the president lived. Um, I can see writing on here. I cannot read it. And maybe it's one of those things where i just seen something I want to see. But I think there's, there's script writing on this tent that I have not been able to resolve closely enough. This is Barnard. And this, I believe this is Barnard himself and his camera, Strawberry Plains. This is a beautiful Poe fort. This is a barefooted soldier. And this is that railroad bridge that Sanders burnt and uh, others was four times, was it, Dot, that it was burned and rebuilt. And this is a beautiful photograph, great detail. Um, another thing about this, uh, this is the railroad, the bridge, the piers, the um, uh, elevated track here, uh, very nice detail. And this is one we don't see as often, but it is Strawberry Plains. Um, there are a lot of guys on the bridge. The fort is still up there behind. And uh, it's one that Barnard took in 1864. Strawberry Plains again. Here is the same soldier. Oh, sorry. Destroyed a, a home. It's probably burned. Uh, I don't know what happened to it. I can't say for sure, but obviously it did not fare well. Um, and then the railroad bridge behind. And this is a beautiful picture. This is Flat Creek. Library of Congress in many places call it Platte Creek, but that's, that's a misnomer. And this is, this is just a beautiful photograph of the two different bridges coming together, the water. And uh, this is numbered, you see down here, You'd like to think that those, all those numbers are sequential and you could find every one and, and know for sure you've got all of the images, but it's st there still could be Barnard photographs out there that we have not yet found. Um, later life, he, this is a, a, a stereo image of his studio in Charleston. Um, he left there, well, this is probably the second, the second time. Remember he was there, then he went to Chicago, then he went back again. This is a portrait of him in later life. And just to say what the critics, in 1980, a man named Keith Davis, who did a wonderful book 10 years later, but he, in the notes for his book, he says, Chicago Historical Society has a number of impressive, unattributed two-plate panorama of Knoxville that could be by Barnard. Well, 20 years earlier, Digby Seymour knew they were by Barnard. But this, again, is before the internet. This guy is looking in Chicago. The other prints are in Washington, maybe in Maryland, and he, hasn't, they hadn't quite, he hadn't quite put the research together. He said, the existence of a two-plate panorama in Sherman's campaign and the evidence that some of Barnett's photographs were used in map making suggests that he may have a large number of these panoramas. Barnard could be revealed as one of the most fascinating photographers of his era. This is what they're saying in 1980. 1990, he, he wrote his book, said, few if any of his contemporary has Barnard's technical expertise, artistic sophistication, pictorial originality, and broad network of professional contacts. His career provides a unique cross-section of the ideals, issues, and personalities of 19th century American photography. It is time George Barnard stepped at least partway out of the shadows of historical neglect. We have much to learn from him. By 2012, the Smithsonian put out a beautiful, big, heavy <laughs> book about art in the Civil War. The art of wartime photography, there's Barnard. He, his picture is featured, his, his photograph is featured above Brady, above Gardner, above uh, Brady, Gardner, O'Sullivan even. Barnard is the one who is recognized as, as uh, one of the most important. Um, and Eleanor Jones Harvey says, Gardner focused on the cost in human lives in this terrible war. I mean, sorry, Gardner did. Barnard, Barnard assembled a visual elegy of the end of the South's antebellum way of life. Both men made individual photographs and then assembled them into 
narrative sequences conveying far more than just the literal words and images. Separately and in competition with each other, they made an eloquent case for photography as an art form. Barnard, Brady, and Gardner's wartime images signaled their belief in the power of photography as genre paintings equal and as genre paintings equal and history painting surrogate. Art made at the moment rather than at a distant remove. So by 2012, Barnard really has come into his own. They've recognized that they being Smithsonian and art critics and historians have recognized that Barnard has uh, a very significant role in Civil War photography and the history of photography. He was buried outside Syracuse, New York um, in rather a small unmarked, not unmarked, but you know, an indistinct grave. And this uh, stone was put there actually in 1962 by the Historical Society to recognize his work and it simply says pioneer in photography. And uh, just a quick overview, how Civil War photography was preserved. As I said, we all grew up thinking that Matthew Brady was the only one who took pictures. Uh, and the, the famous publications of Gardner and Barnard uh, were really the two that came out right after the war, 65 and 66. Um, and um, they were both critically, these two were compared in the Harvey Smithsonian book. Um, in 1911, there was a 10 volume set and by then, my, somebody who knew the dates, by then they were able to reproduce photographs because Miller manages in 10 volumes to produce an amazing collection of Civil War uh, images from all parts of the war. Um, and there was this myth that some of these old glass plates were cleaned off and used in greenhouses. Anybody ever heard that story? I think it's an urban myth. Um, according to the, uh, the stuff that I've read, that, that never really happened. Some of them were broken, um, but much was saved. There were avid collectors, amateur and professional, and there was actual federal legislation eventually. Not right after the war, not soon enough probably, but eventually. But still, much was lost, much has been misattributed, and much has been misidentified. Th things are still being found, uh, printed in the reverse, and as I said, that, po that picture that we've got um, of Fort Sanders that's attributed to Cooley and M Fort McAllister, that's, that's the, the wrong stuff is still there, even though we think we've, we've corrected it. And I think this next picture is one that's, that's very much a tease. I think it's almost positively Atlanta. But if you look at it, wait a minute, I'm going to go through here. See the railroad tracks and the fort at the top and the ditches that go down to the railroad tracks and the hill. If you look at that, you could almost convince yourself it has some similarity to a picture taken from the bottom of the hill at the railroad tracks up to Fort Sanders. I thought. Oh, I'll, I'll figure this out. Are there any railroad tracks near forts in Atlanta? Yeah, there are. <laughs> so can't rule it out that way. The uh, uh, pickets here, well, they did that in Knoxville. The trenches, we had those in Knoxville going to the railroad tracks. <laughs> the what? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, this one is uh, uh, attributed to Barnard in Atlanta in 1864. But wouldn't it be fun if it really were one that we hadn't seen before? All right, panoramic art. <laughs> now with a few minutes to go, we'll get to what this is all about. These panoramic photos are a very rare format for Civil War art. Uh, I can't find another city that was documented the way that Knoxville was. Now there's a three frame panorama of Atlanta that Sherman had done before he burned it, <laughs> which was a nice thing to do. Uh, he he uh, documented what the town looked like in, in three nice panels. It's a, it's a good looking photograph, um, but what he, what Barnard did here, and then, and then there, there's another one in Nashville that's a, that maybe two panels, but 
from the cupola. And we know it was March 19th, 1864. It was cold and it was windy. It probably took them all day to do this. And these are the first four panels, and these are the other three panels. Those seven frames have been put together in that construction over there because he literally took the whole horizon in a cyclorama format. Now, cycloramas, as you know, were famous after the war, but they were painted. Uh, and nobody's really got the photographic material to do th what we can do here. Um, there was also a four-frame image taken from Fort Stanley, and it looks across the river to the university and has the soldiers on the hillside. And then there was a beautiful two-frame picture from Mabry Hill. Now, Poe says when he talks about these pictures, they were done because he wanted to document the fortifications. And he apologizes in one letter, saying they aren't as ar artistic as some of Barnard's work, because the whole point was to get the fortifications in. But I think they are very artistic. And what I'm going to try to do is give you a little bit of an idea of um, how you can navigate these pictures. All right, I'm going to put this off. to frame here, all right. And the first one we're going to go to is this one. Now, that's interesting. I did this on a different computer. What we're going to do is make this bigger. And sorry, I guess I should have stuck with the software I knew. We're going to open it another way. All right, now you can see what we can do here is zoom. And it doesn't just get pixelated. It's got so much data in it that you can get up pretty close and still see more detail. So if we go all the way to the far left here, See, I'm a mouse person. <laughs> I'm not using it. Okay, we're going to go all the way to the edge. This is an enlargement of Fort Dickerson. And at the top here, when you enlarge this even more, and I did this at Library of Congress with one of the original um, photographs, you can see troops and you can see tents. And you can see the trees all cut down. And on the back end of the fort here. You know, this is, this is what we think of the, as the fort today. This is, where the, um, this is this, where the parking lot is. This is the front where there's a pavilion. This is where you hike up a little hill. There's a powder magazine in the middle. All the embrasures are up here. But here you can see that kind of detail. I'm not sure how much more zoom I can get out of it. But with the right software and equipment, it's fascinating to look at the detail of these fortifications. Um, now you can also, I'm going to take it down a little bit because you will lose it. The original photographs have so much um, detail that w if you get a really good scan, a really high resolution scan, um, but we can go across the water here, across the lake, across the river. <laughs> This is where we are right now, right about here. These barracks, there are tents in here. There are, this is central location. Heard of Fort uh, Battery Noble, that's right up here. There are actually two houses up here that are, uh, but the one closest to, the, to Kingston Pike is actually Melrose. It was called uh, 
um, Battery Noble, and it was a Civil War uh, site that was replaced by Hess Hall, if you're familiar with UT now. Now the other locations around here, we can move down a little bit, and we can see Fort Sanders right up here on the high ground. We can see the university. This is the little White House where the president lived. This is the cupola from where those seven frame panorama was taken. And this particular print has, we'll go over here, take it down a little bit. There are what you see, it's been put together, these three frames, and the different um, locations are actually annotated at the bottom of the, frame, at bottom of the print. So getting this print in the size that's manageable, here are those uh, piers, and they're going right across the river here. This is the elevated train uh, route that's going to be later installed. This is the probably the Lee House at this time, L-E-A, later the Mead House, Mead Quarry. It was the uh, marble family that bought it later. It was later purchased by a convent. Nuns had a school there. And then you can see you can travel downtown. These are pretty much our city, still our city streets. This is the Dickinson House. This is Sharps Gap. And you can travel right around the town. Sorry, I'm not as good at this as I should be. There's our downtown. Some of the things that you can identify very, very easily. This is First Presbyterian Church. This is a bridge that goes over the river, the military bridge, Gay Street, and the far side. You've always heard about the hog pens, the hog farm. This is right down below. This is where the Marriott was. This is the hog farms. And if you go all the way to the edge here, you can see where the soldiers' tents were. So this four-frame panorama, it's not the whole 360, but it has so much detail of Knoxville in March. And uh, his diary says, I don't remember if it's before or after the 19th, but you can see that the process of photography at that time captured so much detail and how you can enlarge it to the extent um, that it, you can see things that you, you never guessed you had the ability to view. Um, when one of the early uh, annotated versions of these things uh, came out, and I'm, I'm going to show you that one, uh, they said they used a microscope on it to actually see the trenches. And I go, that makes good sense. That could be kind of fun too. Um, but, you know, in this day and age of digital photography, it's very easy to get, you know, you get to the point where you, all you see is big pixels and it's not giving you any more information. I wish that the abilities they have on CSI Miami, you know, where they have the 3D screen and he says, you know, I see a, a, a reflection that started in the car and it goes through a plate glass window and a mirror and I'm like, give me that and they can bring out a face. I don't think that exists, but yeah. I certainly don't have, the, have that ability. Now let me show you the, this is the, uh, from the south. Okay, now the other one I wanted to show you, the six frame, let me try this one. Uh, right click and open with. Microsoft. Is that the one we just saw? Yes, sorry. Let's go back. No, we didn't. Is that the one we just did? No? Okay. Sorry. This was a lot easier yesterday on my desktop. All right. Didn't we start out with Fort? Yeah, this is the one we saw. This has Fort Dickerson. It didn't go all the way over to here. It cut off before we got there. All right. Let me zoom, and we'll start on the other side. Make it bigger. And we're going to go all the way to the end. And then you can see some of the soldiers here. 
Look at the details of these guys. Look how the trees are stripped, about as far up as you can climb easily. Um, and then the, the tents are there in the detail of the soldiers. Just and then coming back down to the hog farms. And up in here, these are gonna, this is probably Fort Huntington Smith, which is where the Green Magnet School is now. And um, again, when you enlarge this, it's possible to see a whole lot more detail. Now, I want to go, I want to make sure I get to the seven frames and the cupola ones. Now, this is This is looking, basically, this is Kingston Pike. You're looking out Kingston Pike this way. This is a sinkhole that's kind of under the law school <laughs> or the Panhellenic building. <laughs> Whoops, right. It was like, hmm, I wonder if that has anything to do with what's going on. This is the home of Hugh Lawson White, who ran for president in uh, the 1840s against uh, Jackson. These are the buildings up there at the top of the hill. So he's in the middle and he's taking pictures from this height and then it goes down to the river. So when this is enlarged, we've got details of the town. We've got Fort Sanders uh, up here and we've got this wonderful little house that's no, not there anymore. It would have been at the bottom of the hill uh, at UT. Let's move this. Isn't that nice when it gets sharp? <laughs> and go over here to the end. One of the details I like about this one is there's a horse tied up in front of this house. This house is no longer there. This is the um, Kingston Pike going this direction. These are rifle trenches going across the road. This is Fort Sanders. This is, as we move to the east, you're going to see more tents. This would be Battery Zollner, I think. There's Sharp Scap again. And here, this is what they called then the Deaf and Dumb Asylum. And you can see all the tents out here. Second Creek is going to run down this direction. This is the White House later owned by the Rogers family. This is the uh, spire steeple at Second Presbyterian Church, which was right down near Market Square. And again, when this is enlarged, there is, you can see more of the detail. I don't, I'm not quite sure how far I can go with it. Yeah, see, brings in those tents, the camp, some of the houses. West. This is downtown, and these are these are the main streets of the town. The when this is a little clearer, you can see the uh, tower at the courthouse, and um, let's move it down a little bit. All right, I'm going to move it up a little bit. Uh, I wish I had my real mouse. Again, look at the detail of these homes. It almost looks like you could look in the windows to see who's who's in there, and then we can again look at the railroad, uh, the military bridge. This is the Mead House again. Here's the military bridge across the across the river. The wider ones you're looking at Maine and Cumberland, and um, probably. You know, this, this, this is uh, Maine, and less, I better say, Maine and Cumberland and Hill, the, the, the names are the same as they, today, it's the same downtown grid. I know most of you have seen that wonderful map that we overlaid present day streets in 1864. The names are, ha are, are all still the same. I have been spending the week with the map and the pictures and the computer screen and trying and getting inside that seven frames and trying to find north. I, I've got it on the map and it's kind of parallel with Broadway, 
but standing in there trying to figure out a sharp gap left or right of Broadway and you know I figured once I got north then all I had to do was put the other four other three directions easily enough around it was way harder <laughs> than it sounds so if you take the opportunity to look in there and look at your panorama um, and you think that maybe north is off let me know because I, uh, I I found that well it, Poe, Poe writes about using these maps to uh, using these photographs to help with his mapping and you can see that that ability to take geography and translate it into two dimensions whether it's photographic or cartographic and make the information accurate and easily discernible that that's an art a skill a science and uh, we in Knoxville have a very um, wonderful information legacy to draw upon to get those facts quite straight and then you can go to the city directories and see who lived in these houses and um, you know the the census the census they went house to house to house so even though the census doesn't have the physical address in it um, you can begin to get a relationship as to where people were in the 1860s and let me just show you that one last one which is um, well there's Mabry Hayes in here this one is so detailed and it's, this is the one that was uh, flipped in Digby Seymour's book. Um, but if you zoom it, let's see, it will click into focus. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I want to show you this for this, though, is look at this guy. He's got a pipe in his mouth. That pond over there, that is the flooded First Creek. That is not the river. The river is, in fact, in the picture, but it's way over this other side. There's the river. So this is the main road. And Calvin, does this look familiar? <laughs> we were up at Mabry Hazen House last week with this picture looking out generally in the same direction, trying to figure out. Now, you can see that the Sanders, uh, I'm sorry, Poe, the, the, the main idea was to take pictures of the fortifications. So from here, he's got two batteries and, sorry, I need to go over to the right a little further, and this big, beautiful fort, which is Fort Huntington Smith, which is on the hill, which is where the Green Magnet School is now. When you look from present day, this road is pretty much Summit Hill Drive. And then this is the fort. And then you can look down into the north part of town where the flood plain was. And it made perfect sense to use the natural resources to defend the town. You cannot charge infantry through a pond. And it made, so w the purpose of this photograph was to get in as much of the fortification and defense that Poe could get in. But Barnard still put his signature man with, for scale and then that pipe and um, got way more of the detail of the town than, than we could have hoped for. Uh, question? No, I don't think it is. I don't think it is, but they came with a third man. There were three of them. Um, and I don't know who, was, who that is. Obviously, it's in, almost in silhouette. So I've never seen Poe smoke a pipe, but it might just be a prop, too. So uh, I don't know who is, who's, in the, who's in the picture. But the, um, the third man, there was some speculation that the third man's name was Coonley. There are two guys, Cooley and Coonley, who are both skilled photographers who travel in the same kind of circles as Barnard. And it's, you know, that's very confusing. This is not Coonley. Um, it might be a man named Adams. I think that was the man who accompanied him. And it's pretty much quarter after three or more. So I think I will end here, but letting you know that these images are all available at Library of Congress. You can get onto your computer, go to Library of Congress, and download very large TIFF files, and then you will spend hours going through the details as I've gone through here. If you want to take the time to look at this uh, panorama, it's 
you know, it's not perfect. Um, we tried to make it eye level. We've, it, it's got the three-dimensional experience that nobody's been able to do since 1864. But we could do it better. We could make a tighter, crisper image. And um, I, I thought, well, I, I could consult an optics engineer or somebody. How, how far from your face should it be to simulate real panorama at the time? And I, we didn't do that. It, that got way too complicated. But it does give you a pretty good idea of what it would be like standing on that cupola in March of 1864. Um, can't quite simulate the wind and, and the cold temperatures, but it gives you an idea of what Knoxville looked like at that one point in time. Thank you. Pardon me?